For many of us, as the world has opened back up, we have planned some sort of travel endeavor. And I think that especially rings true this summer. Today, I have a two-part episode for you. First, I am interviewing Don Barclay, the author of Traveling Different, Vacation Strategies for Parents of the Anxious, the Inflexible, and the Neurodiverse. And then I'm doing my own little travel Q&A because this is a topic that I'm especially passionate about and has been very important for my family over the years. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am excited to welcome Don Barclay to the podcast. I reached out to you all to get some questions about traveling and I received an overwhelming amount. So I posed some of these questions to Dawn, and then following my interview with her, I'm also doing a Q&A, giving some of my own thoughts. Dawn's book, which specializes in vacation strategies for parents of anxious and flexible and neurodiverse kids, is one that was in the making for many years. As she explains to us in this chat today, it's only in recent years that there have been enough resources available to write this book. Don wrote this to be a travel Bible for parents of kids on the autism spectrum, parents of kids with ADHD, anxiety, or who otherwise struggle with change. Let's face it, travel is full of change. If you're parenting a kid like this, then you know travel can feel especially intimidating. Although let's be honest, travel is intimidating for us all when it comes to kids and for adults too. I've been known to become a little anxious and inflexible when all my life circumstances change as well. Maybe that resonates with you. And the pandemic has made travel all that much more anxiety provoking. I'm happy to share Dawn's work with you and also thrilled that she is making the world more accessible for families with unique needs. And I wanted to include my own Q&A today because I've been thinking about travel a lot. We have a month long trip coming up in August, so I'll be sharing more about the planning for that and the ideas and the goals behind that. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, Don. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for having me today. I appreciate it. Well, I am glad to chat with you. When I heard about your book, I thought that with the state of the world, you know, coming out of this pandemic and so many families jumping on the travel boat and not the real boat, some of us, I guess, (laughs) um, that we could use all the tips we can get about traveling with kids. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this book and how it's personal to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in a travel family. My parents owned a big travel agency in Manhattan. And so I grew up traveling from age two. And when I was, um, and I worked in travel for very many years, uh, both as a travel agent and as um, a senior or contributing editor with some major travel trade publications. So when I had my children, Um, I found that they weren't as excited about travel as I was, uh, or willing to do it, (laughs) do it uh, cooperatively. (laughs) They, they were anxious and inflexible. And so I looked for a book that would help me deal with this because I believe there's a book for everything and there wasn't a book for this. So I started interviewing back in the early 2000s. I spoke to Dr. Tony Atwood, who's big in, um, ASD circles. I spoke to Dr. Ellen Littman, who deals with children, all sorts of children, but especially with ADHD. And then I kind of hit a wall. And it wasn't until I found an organization called IBCCES, which put out the Certified Autism Travel Professional uh, designation that I knew how to write the book because Mm -hmm. uh, they're trained to handle families with all sorts of children, and they've had intense training, and um, many of them are special needs parents, and they introduced me to other parents, and a lot more information was on the internet to do research in 2019, so I was able to write this book. 
So when you became a parent, did you have high hopes and plans for traveling with your family? Oh, yes, because I'd been traveling since I was a little kid. And, you know, my my grandparents um, and aunt and uncle were in London. So I was always traveling transatlantically, um, especially by ship, because uh, my mother was definitely afraid of flying. So I had I had an orientation to anxious and inflexible people, even as a kid, as my mother was. Uh, so, yeah, I, I thought that it would be their childhood would be kind of like mine. Do you have fond memories? Was it easy for you to travel and be flexible? Um, with my kids? As when you were a kid. Oh, yeah, I was. I love traveling. Yeah, okay. you, I couldn't travel enough. In fact, my father would run these uh, special tours for church groups and my grandmother would go along and, and I'd come to see them off at the airport and I always wanted to sneak off onto the plane. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I couldn't understand why I couldn't go on every trip. Tell me a little bit about your first experiences traveling with anxious and flexible kids and what did that look like? Oh, gosh. Um, Well, I just want to say that this book really isn't about me. And I mean, I interviewed over 100 people, and I really talk about their experiences much more than mine. Um, I had children who didn't deal well with transitions. And so I couldn't bring one of them into department stores without screaming. I couldn't make um, a road trip, even going to the uh, supermarket, if I wanted to stop at the dry cleaners on the way back. I would hear screaming because it was a change in routine um, and expectations. Um, I had one trip where I got on the plane and we buckled up and that's when my son decided to vomit all over me. (laughs) Mm. So that could certainly happen to anybody. And then my daughter started screaming because of the pressure in her ears. And a woman next to me asked to have her seat changed, but I couldn't Mm -hmm. go anywhere. So I just put a sweater over my silk blouse and dealt with it. And my husband, who is um, very good at improvising, took out the the bags from the front pocket of um, the seat and started, pulled out some crayons and created barf bag theater and entertained (laughs) the children. And that's how we got through that. So my experiences, what I learned was to deal with everything with humor and to not really care much about what anybody else thought. Mm, I love that. I think we can apply that to so many areas of parenting beyond travel. Yeah. So I I had asked for some questions from my audience in advance about this topic, and I had a couple people ask about navigating multi-generational family travel. And that's something that isn't easy on any level, but if you have a kid who has unique needs it can be more complicated if those extended family members don't understand or don't handle those needs in the way you do. I think a lot of what I've written the book about is strategies so that you, before you even get to your destination, you've thought of a lot of backup plans and how to deal with say sensory overload. And you certainly don't have to be on an autistic spectrum to have sensory overload because what I found in researching this book is that Every child, when taken out of their comfort zone, becomes anxious and inflexible. So I feel that any special needs travel tips can apply to all kids. So I guess the idea is to introduce the, I mean, you can introduce the concept of your kids to the adults. Hopefully that will go well. I didn't really concentrate on that in the book because I figure you know how to talk to adults. But with a small child, getting them ready for the trip, there's so many different things you can do. You can get picture books that show their favorite characters and travel situations. And I list some in the book, but certainly your librarian at your local library can, you know, recommend many more. And uh, there are videos for every aspect of a vacation that you can find on YouTube or offered by a supplier. Again, I think you, you can't really think, I'm just going to spring it on the kid and they'll have the, all this excitement about learning about everything. Remember, kids are creatures of habit and routine and they crave predictability and familiarity. And nothing is going to be as unfamiliar as travel. So you have to put yourself in their mindset. Um, and what you can also do is create many experiences ahead of time. So for example, if you've never been to the beach, maybe you want to get some sand at a craft store and lay out a tarp on your living room floor and have the kid walk in sand so they can experience that. Or if they're in a warm climate and they're going, say, to Alaska, maybe you want to have them practice wearing multi-layers. 
because that's not something they're familiar with. And that's something that's going to throw any kid off. So little yeah. things that you can do, uh, you know, you can take a small car trip before you take a large one. Before you go on a tour, go to a local zoo or an aquarium and call it a tour and have the child experience what it's going to be like on a longer tour. Yeah, it's funny you, you mentioned the clothing thing because I raised my kids for the first few years in Texas and then we moved to New York. And I didn't really realize that they had barely worn socks most of their lives. Yeah. And then when we moved to New York, they they had no interest in wearing socks. It took a good probably two years to get them into the habit of accepting socks because yeah. they just, it wasn't part of their routine and it was different. And and I can't say that I blame them. I pr much prefer to be walking around in my Birkenstocks every day, 365 days of the year. <laughs> sure. Um, sure. But yeah, it, it can take some time to adjust to to different, different climates, different sensory experiences. Yeah. I think we, we tend to have this really high bar for travel or we kind of imagine what it's going to be. And we, the anticipation of travel is the fun of it for a lot of us, you know, the planning and the dreaming of what it's going to be like. And then it doesn't often turn out that way when kids are involved, right? Things can go yeah. in so many different directions than, than what a parent idealizes. Yeah, you have to break it down into little components from the time you leave the house to the time you come back and then set up, figure out where your triggers are going to be, where there might be chaos and crowds and things that the child is unfamiliar with and create some backup plans. And I also recommend creating a child-centric holiday. So along with offering the child some um, buy-in with the trip by maybe taking three destinations that you've already approved and asking them which one they'd like to go to or everything that you want to do during the day, what would you like to do? So they get some, you know, purchase in it. Um, also take into account some of their special, um, special passions and interests. So if you have a child that loves dinosaurs, maybe you find a dinosaur museum near where you're going and you make sure that that's part of your trip. And in the book, I list all the special interests I could think of and break down uh, venues that cater to those interests by state and then by city. So that's an easier thing to do. Oh, I love that. I think that's, that's really great because so, I mean, we have to be considerate of all the people in the family. And I think about my husband's special travel needs, which are eating all the food <laughs> at all the different restaurants and and what he likes to walk and to wander. And I do too. And that is something that our kids do not enjoy. Like if we go to a new city, just kind of wandering aimlessly around a city, looking at the parks and the, uh, no, absolutely not. My kids are not down for that in any way, shape or form. Um, so we, that's something that we just really don't do in the same way, but we found doing something like a double decker bus tour. Now that's, that's fun for the kids, but walking for hours, exploring a new city, it's not worth, it's painful for all of us. We used to do the same thing with duck tours. Wherever we could go, oh, we yeah. did those duck tours because the kids love them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I almost forgot about that. I used to live in Washington, DC and they have a lot of duck tours in DC. And yeah. I remember seeing those boats a lot. I'm, we so haven't done that fun. as a family. I'm going to have to put that on our, on our travel wish list. Um, so we're doing something different. In August, we are going, we're, we're spending a whole month in Oaxaca, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And we have been, we went five years ago for a week and we loved it. And we're going back for a more extended stay. Um, and I, it's sort of a different travel experience than we've done before because we've only really traveled for shorter periods of time, like one or two weeks. But one thing that actually that we've done a little differently this time that has worked for us um, ha is that in the past, I've tried to read specific books about our destination. Like we're going to Greece. Here's a book about Greece. We're going to Texas. Here's a book about Texas. Um, but this time they don't seem interested at all in their six and eight in hearing books about Oaxaca, Mexico and like all the things we're going to see. But we've been reading books by Mexican authors about Mexican culture. And there's a lot of Spanish in them. There's a lot of cultural elements in, in, integrated into them. And they're actually really into that, which is, is kind of unexpected. No, I think that's a great idea. I do talk about a mom in the book who did that sort of thing. Like she'd create a month that might be Italy month and they would eat Italian food and they'd learn a couple of words of Italian and they would, um, 
you know, look at the money, look at videos and sort of introduce the child to a different culture without ever leaving home and make Mm. sure that the child knows that they're part of a global community. We're going to pause for a one minute word from today's sponsor. The sponsor for today is Indeed. Don't you love it when you make a small change and suddenly everything becomes so much easier? That's what it's like when you start hiring with Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. So instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed is a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. You can find great talent faster through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. My favorite thing about Indeed is that it's simple. It streamlines a process that otherwise can feel very complex. And Indeed is doing something that no other job site has done. Now with Indeed, businesses only pay for quality applications matching the sponsored job description. Visit indeed.com slash families to start hiring now. Go to indeed.com slash families. Indeed.com slash families. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Dawn. The idea that if you're 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 challenged with an inflexible kid, then by nature as a parent, you need to be more flexible. Yes, right. Especially when Absolutely. you're when you're really getting out of your comfort zone like this is. Yeah, maybe your rules are not usually that you have an iPad at the dinner table, but knowing you're out of your element, you're out of your comfort zone. Everybody is sort of pushed to the max. Maybe you do have to flex your rules a little bit. Yeah. So always bring things that keep the child occupied. Yeah. And I think the frequency, like if you're going for a week vacation, not planning to do a long restaurant meal every night at dinner time, if your kids aren't up for that, right. um, that I feel like is um, probably something that I would have like pre kid me would have been like, no way my kids are going to go to a restaurant every meal out of on vacation. And then now I'm like, eh, that's just, it's, it's a lot to sit yeah. for every single day, day after day. So, well, um, now in this po- post, COVID world, there are a lot more restaurants that are delivering Mm -hmm. or there's DoorDash. So you could always pick these great restaurants that you want to try and sample them in the hotel. Yeah. I had a question from someone that asked if you have any ideas for helping kids who need to physically move on a long flight. I, I think that if I was traveling for a very long flight, I'd break it up. And I maybe if I was going on a 10 hour flight, I'd break it up into two five hour flights and have a long layover Yeah, and make sure there was something to do where I was stopping, like make sure that maybe there's a indoor playground at the airport. You can always find out what sort of amenities are at an airport so that the child can get, you know, blow off some steam. Mm -hmm. And a lot of airports do have little indoor playgrounds and that kind of thing now. Yeah. And sensory rooms. Some are having sensory rooms, so they are taking into account that some ch- children have sensory meltdowns and need that quiet and area for decompression. Mm. We were on a train a couple years ago that had a kid's car, like that they could you could go to the car and they could climb around and like sort of a playground in the train car, which I thought was really neat. That's um, great. Give kids that space for movement. Yeah, and you talk about other types of transportation too, which I think is really fun because kids really like that variety, right? Bus, train, cruise, travel. Are there any that you feel like are, that really do cater well to kids that have a harder time traveling? Um, I think cruises are terrific. That might be because I cruised a lot as a kid, but all of the five major cruise lines have training for children with, uh, who are anxious or inflexible or on the spectrum. So I, you know, and that gives everybody a lot of options because the kids can be in a kid's club and you can be with your, um, significant other or your partner and still enjoy the cruise. There are also resorts that have the same like beaches in Jamaica and Turks and Caicos have the same setup and they are advanced sort of they're certified autism centers. So if you have a child on the spectrum, it works well for them. But any child that needs special assistance will do well there. And I list a number of other places like that. But you you know, sports vacations work because there's a lot for everybody to do if you do have a child with special needs and you go on a skiing vacation or golf or to a dude ranch um, with horseback riding or even scuba diving. There are programs that help children. Mm. 
Yeah, that's and you have a, all these things listed. Your book is just kind of this one big resource manual, right? That I tried to be like the travel Bible for oh. for parents who have children who are anxious and flexible and neurodiverse. Right. And what do you what are your thoughts about different accommodations? Are there some that are better or easier for families? I honestly feel like if you don't go with a residential, like extended stay hotel, which gives you more space and more space is always good as well as a kitchen, then look into a vacation rental Mm -hmm. um, because you're going to probably have less hassle at check-in. You're not going to have the kind of crowds that you would have in a big hotel lobby. Um, And, and there's going to be more space and that's what kids need is their own space. So I do have a, um, an area that where I discuss um, vetting a vacation rental and what to look for. Mm. And also even think about a houseboat. If you want a sort of a, a a cross between a cruise, you're not ready for a cruise, but uh, you don't want to stay in a hotel. A houseboat might be a good solution and you don't necessarily have to sail anywhere. You can keep it docked. Yeah. I don't know how people travel without access to laundry. I feel like that is such a necessity for me. Um, so we almost always do a house rental so we can make sure to have our washer and dryer. And that that's that's a big priority. But you're right about vetting the rental spaces because I remember traveling with little kids and I ended up once in uh, an Airbnb that had, it was someone's house that they had lived in and then they would leave when they rented it. And that part wasn't so obvious until we got there and we found that like their bathrooms were like filled with medications and just, it was just not in any way, shape or form child friendly. Yeah. And you're also going to want to make sure that there are things nearby, like whether it's a park or a supermarket or a hospital or whatever you're going to want to be near, you know, now it's easy to research everything, but it's a matter of thinking ahead. What am I going to need? And I, so I find that a book like this is helpful because it's like one giant checklist of what to worry about. Right. And, and we'll also make mistakes. Um, yeah. I remember this, we, we hiked to this beach that was supposed to be a secluded beach and it was a hike down to the beach. And we didn't think about the fact that once we got down there and we spent the day at the beach that we would also have to hike with the kids and all the stuff back out, which was straight <laughs> uphill in the heat of the mid afternoon. Oh, um, wow. But right. The thing is you don't, you, it, it, as much as you want to anticipate all of the hurdles, you can't. Well, thank goodness. There's always a next time because right. now, you know. Yes, yes. Now you know what to ask. And that's why I say you have to, it's all trial and error. And just don't feel like if you read the book, you're going to be set. You should always do your due diligence. Any place that I mention, you should call ahead and make sure that what they offer is what you need. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, because things change. Uh, and it's important to make sure since all children are different, that there's a good, you know, marriage between their needs and what's what's offered. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So this is not your first book, right? Tell us about your other works. (laughs) My other work, well, I've been a travel columnist for years and years, but my other books were fiction. I write psychological thrillers and romantic suspense. And there's one woman's fiction in there too. Uh, So yeah, I write Mm. under a different name. I write under D period, M period, bar, B-A-R-R. And um, yeah, I'm starting a new thriller. So. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> so this, was this kind of a labor of love that in this first nonfiction book? This was supposed to be my first book. And like I said, I started writing it and then I sort of hit a wall because yeah. I knew I wanted to speak to parents um, who had children on the spectrum. And it was very hard at the time to figure out who to speak to. So I put it aside and I came back yeah. to it after, you know, I found IBCCES. But um, what is, tell us more about what IB. IBCCES stands for the International Board of uh, Credentialing and Continuing Education Standards. I know it's a big mouthful, (laughs) (laughs) but they're the ones who certify certified autism travel professionals. So if you do have a child um, on the spectrum or with special needs, you really should speak to one. And I list in the book how to get a hold of them. Um, But they also certify different resorts that cater to people with invisible disabilities, as well as the regular public. So it's really a very, you know, it's a great organization. And there are other other companies that are doing certifications, too. 
Mm, I love that. I feel like uh, until these resources were available, really families, especially families with kids on the spectrum, really relied on each other for references that finding, finding things that would make them feel more comfortable and more confident in their traveling was just a lot harder. Yeah. So much more information now. So many different companies are out there certifying. I think that whether it's, I think whether it's empathy or economics, there is much more of an eye on diversity and inclusivity now. Yes. Oh, I love that so much. Well, I am so happy to see this resource out in the world. Out Is it August 15th? Yeah. The book is called Traveling Different Vacation Strategies for Parents of the Anxious, the Inflexible, and the Neurodiverse. It comes out August 15th, but it's available now for pre-order in hardcover, ebook, and uh, audiobook. And I also have a website called travelingdifferent.com where I am um, updating and supplementing the book as well as um, listing where people can find it, where they can order it, um, if they want to bring me on to speak. All that information is there. Great. And is this sort of like other travel books and then it will be updated regularly, the text itself? I, what I did was 85% of the book are the strategies, which are okay. not necessarily going to be up, needed to be updated. Only 15% are the locations that I'm mentioning, uh, which I will update on the blog, which is one of the reasons I created the blog is so I could constantly be updating the book that way. Great. And if anyone has any to add, they can just get in touch with you? If they have questions or, or if they resources, extra resources. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have my email in the book uh, and I'm happy. And I also have Twitter and Facebook and I'm always happy to speak to people. Um, also, if I've opened up the world to them in any way, I'd love them to contact me. And also if they would do one thing for me, and that is if um, great to go out and buy the book, but if you could ask your library to order it, that would be a great thing. So people who can't afford it can have access to it too. Perfect. And I will do that the next time I'm in. Great. Thank you so much, Don. It's been good chatting. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Don. I received so many questions on this topic. I decided that I wanted to tackle some of them myself too. As always, the thoughts that I'm sharing here may or may not resonate with you. Feel free to take what works for you and leave what doesn't. You are the expert on your family. For the month of August, my family is taking off to stay for a month in Oaxaca, Mexico. We planned this trip a year ago. And when I say we planned the trip a year ago, I mean that we reserved the Airbnb a year ago. And that's pretty much it. I find that traveling with kids is always a balance. Feeling like we need to plan to make it feel more predictable. To be able to give them an idea of what to anticipate but not over planning because over planning tends to leave us all frazzled and frustrated and disappointed when things don't measure up to those expectations that we've set. In all the questions I received, I got a lot of questions around gear and strategy. Tell me what to buy to make my life easier. Tell me the strategies to make it go more smoothly. And while I do think that there's a place and a time for getting the right gear and having the right strategies, bigger than that, a shift in mindset can take you even further. First of all, ask yourself, what is the goal of this travel? How will you define it as successful? For a lot of us, depending what kind of thinker you are, you might have a visual representation of what a successful trip looks like. Maybe you're going to Disney World and that trip looks like all the kids, all the grownups, smiling and laughing, happy and content every day all day. Now, I know you know that that's not going to happen and that you are more of a realist to know that this is nothing more than an idealized vision. There is nothing in parenthood that looks like that, especially traveling, especially vacation, which can really be taxing on us all. So check yourself. Even if I asked you, you know, if you were sitting next to me right now and I said, what are your goals for this vacation? How do you imagine it looking? You might say, oh yeah, it's going to be kind of hard, but we'll do this. We got this. Feeling very positive about it, right? You might be able to verbally acknowledge that you realize it's not going to be perfect, but somewhere deep down in your mind, how are you visually creating or anticipating those memories to look? Are you running a little visual movie in your head 
that shows all those happy smiling faces all the time. Those visualizations are really powerful for setting up the expectations for what this time together is going to look like. So when you're visualizing the trip, visualize all those happy smiling faces, all the laughing, all the joy. Visualize a couple tantrums. Visualize some meltdowns for everybody. Visualize canceling some activities or having some activities canceled on you. Visualize a delayed flight and overtired kids. Visualize both positive and challenging outcomes. So you know anything's possible. So if you do encounter the challenging outcomes, which you will, you're going to be more prepared because that was part of your vision too. Now, I don't see this as expecting the worst and hoping for the best. Instead, I see this as just embracing the highs and lows, the highs and lows that we face every single day when we're home with our families. And those highs and lows follow us when we travel. So above all, all the good strategies, all the good gear, that can be helpful. But visualizing many different outcomes can take you even further. And when the trip is over, don't be quick to size it up as good or bad. Every trip, just like every day, has good moments and bad moments. I have personally found, I don't know if this resonates with you all, but the further I get from a trip, the more fondly I remember it. So the day I get back when I'm still super tired, I don't size it up because I don't feel like that's really a fair time to assess. So a little bit of behind the scenes on how we have planned for this month-long trip. It's not something we've ever done before. It's longer than we've ever traveled with our kids. So we reserved the Airbnb. We made the flight reservations. That part was almost easy. Now figuring out exactly what we're going to do there for a whole month, that is a little more complicated. And the anxious nature in me wants to plan it all out before we get there. Because I do know that my kids like to know what to expect. They like to have an idea, but I also do too. I really thrive when I know the plan. So the tentative plan for this month is for the kids to get more exposure to the culture. We visited Oaxaca five years ago when my daughter was a baby, and we knew we wanted to go back and spend some more time. My husband is Hispanic, and we haven't always found it easy to pass along the language and the culture on our own. So this extended trip is intended to do that. So we're definitely going to put them in some Spanish classes. I was tempted to research Spanish schools for kids extensively, and I did a little bit. But from my own travel experience, I know that sometimes it's better just to arrive and check out the resources when you get there. I joined a Facebook group for expats in Oaxaca, for travelers in Oaxaca, And I found a lot of resources there, but I haven't committed to anything, which is hard for me. So the first week when we arrive, I'm going to go around and visit some different language schools, some different kids programs, and see what feels right, see what's available. And I will say, finding Facebook groups for this has been so amazing. Sure, there are guidebooks that aren't always super updated, There are travel bloggers online and YouTubers that share videos. But for this trip, I found that getting in touch with people who are on the ground doing similar trips has been the best resource for us. So that is something that we're going to do differently on this trip is that we are planning less, trying to connect with others who have done similar trips very recently, and making most of our plans when we hit the ground. We are going to be traveling light. We do have access to laundry, thank goodness. We're each going to have a roller bag, and then we're going to have one checked bag where I am going to bring along some toys. So far, I have a craft set for my daughter, a Lego set for my son, and I think I'm going to put some scooters in there too because we are going to be walking a lot. We're not going to have a car. And I know that part's not going to be so easy for my kids whose legs seem to get very tired very quickly. When we're traveling, that is. Not when they're running around playing with their friends. You know how that goes. All right, so I'm going to take a few questions from you all. Here's one. How do you do long road trips with kids? Our kids can barely make it three hours without complaining. We want to teach them to be flexible and patient, but it's torture for us. 
Yeah. You said your kids can barely make it three hours without complaining. If they could make it even almost three hours without complaining, I actually would consider that a win. (laughs) Um, Complaining in general can be very triggering for us. I know for me it can because when I hear my kids complain, it triggers something within me that says, I'm not doing what I need to do to make my kids happy. I'm lacking in some way. My job as the mom is to make sure that my kids are happy all the time. And I'm failing at that right now because they are complaining. They are unhappy, right? Those are the feelings that come up for me. Now, I know on an intellectual level that they're not true, but on a deeper level, they still feel true. So the first thing I do when I start to feel triggered around complaining is I notice that, right? I remind myself, Danae, it's okay for them to be a little uncomfortable. It's okay for them to be unhappy. I mean, generally road trips are pretty boring, There's not really any reason for them to be experiencing a great amount of joy and lighting up unless they're making some really cool stops that is or watching some really great show, which both are great additions for a road trip. And a lot of people ask in with questions about how to limit screen time when traveling and we don't limit screen time while in motion on a plane, in a car. We loosely have a rule in the car that if the trip is over three hours, they can have electronic usage unlimited. If it's less than three hours, then we don't do electronics other than music, listening to audiobooks on their Yotos, that sort of thing. On planes, always access to electronics for as long as they want. In the early days, we used to try to pack a lot of other stuff, toys, activity books, sticker books, that kind of thing. And we just found that they were used so little, maybe for a couple minutes at a time during the whole trip. And for that reason, it felt like to bring all that stuff on a plane or in a car, I was actually spending more time picking it up off the floor than they were using it. So if we do bring that stuff, like we will bring some of that stuff for our longer trip, especially for the kids to use at restaurants and that sort of thing. But when we're actually in motion, we're on a plane, We're on an extended road trip. We do let them watch as much television or shows or games or whatever it is as possible. And I know it's tricky because for a lot of kids, excessive screen time can cause difficult behaviors. If you have a kid like that, you know the anticipation of those negative behaviors as a result of too much screen time can evoke a lot of anxiety in you. In my experience, these kids who we feel like experience negative side effects from too much screen time also experience negative side effects from not moving their bodies for long periods of time. Maybe I'm talking about all kids here, but I think some kids are especially susceptible to this. So if you have a kid that just needs to move their body a lot, and they also have a hard time stepping away from screen time, cutting out screen time while traveling won't very likely solve the problem because they're still not able to move much when they're traveling. So even if you do cut out screen time, you may still see a bounce back in difficult behaviors after you land, you get off the plane or after you get out of the car because they've been tied down, unable to move for so long. So for that reason, personally, in my own experience, maybe not accurate for you, I don't see a ton of value in limiting screen time on a long road trip or on a plane when that child still has to be restrained in a car seat or in a seatbelt and can't really move because no matter what, When they get off the plane, it's going to be hard, especially if they haven't slept well, haven't ate well, all the things. So for all the people that wrote in asking, what are screen-free alternatives? I guess it would be take a bike trip instead of a road trip. Keep them moving as much as possible. And if that's not an option, understanding that, yes, sometimes difficult behaviors do follow difficult travel experiences, especially if those travel experiences include a kid that's going to be restrained for a long period of time. I don't know if restrained is the right word. Belted in. In our early years of traveling, I also spent a ton of effort trying to get my kids to sleep and take naps on planes. I remember when my son was two and we flew to Spain. It was an overnight flight. We departed. We were supposed to depart at 7. We ended up departing around 9 p.m. at night. And we didn't land until around... 6 a.m. and he didn't fall asleep until the descent the last 20 minutes of the flight I didn't think it was humanly possible for a two-year-old to stay up all night but he did 
but you better believe I did everything humanly possible to get this kid to fall asleep. I rocked him. I walked him. I created a little bed at our feet. I let him lay on me. I laid him in the bassinet. Some planes for extended flights have bassinets, which we did. Nothing worked. He stayed up all night long. I thought for sure it was going to be the end of us. A terrible way to start off a trip. But it was fine. He was a little grumpy, absolutely, so was I. But we slept. We took a little bit more downtime than we anticipated. And we still had a good trip. And in retrospect, I think the only thing I would have changed is I would have stressed less about how much sleep he got on the plane. I would have enjoyed the flight more, that's for sure. Next question, how do you deal with jet lag and grouchy kids when you yourself are exhausted too? Tips for keeping calm and making sure that you are rested. Well, when you're dealing with a lot of jet lag, it's important to be very realistic for everyone, not planning too much on your first couple days. The rule of thumb that has worked for us is each day modifying bedtime by two hours. So if you're doing a six hour time change, inching the bedtime closer to the local time by two hours a night. So that by the third night, they're on a regular bedtime again. But for those first three days, taking it really easy and understanding that everybody's behavior and everybody's sleep is going to be wonky. Now, of course, some kids are going to take longer than that. I know for myself personally, small amounts of melatonin have been helpful with time changes, especially big time changes. So if that's something that you're interested in, talking to your pediatrician to see if that's something that would suit your family. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving medical advice here. All right, next question. The first night at a new place, we have such a hard time getting our littles to sleep. We have an upcoming trip, and my only concern is the first and probably second nights when my new five-year-old is bouncing around and the almost two-year-old keeps crying and the grown-ups get no time to talk to the grown-ups we've traveled to visit. Yeah, this can be really frustrating, but I think the wonderful part of it is that you can anticipate it and you can even tell the people that you're going to visit. Yeah, the first two nights are probably going to be pretty rough and our kids are probably going to need more attention than usual. You give them a heads up so they anticipate it. It's absolutely understandable for both kids and adults alike to have a harder time sleeping in a new place. All right, we have a trip out west planned in October and we'll be flying a four-hour flight. My kiddos will be five, three, and almost one. We haven't flown since before our second was born. Do you have tips for keeping everyone sane on the airplane? Or any tips for packing, aka not overpacking? We will have laundry access to wash clothes, but I'm still worried I'll overpack because the weather can be so unpredictable in the mountains at that time of the year. If you're going to have access to laundry, even just bringing three days worth of clothes is going to be enough. So what I would do is designate the suitcases that you're going to bring and bring nothing else, right? Like I've done for our upcoming trip in August. We're each bringing a carry-on roller bag, and then we're bringing one checked bag. It must fit into those parameters. We're not bringing any other bags. So we've set the size of the container, and we're going to stick with it. That will prevent us from overpacking. Now, you got to be careful, because if you have really little kids, which you do, you can fit a lot of clothes in a little carry-on bag. So even if you just have a little roller bag, you could still fit far too many clothes and still overpack. So you might want to do a roller bag for two kids, especially if their clothes are really tiny. Another question about overpacking. Being a mom in the baby stage still, I'm tempted to pack to the max to make sure they're comfortable and in turn make the trip the most enjoyable. Yeah, you know, I overpacked in the beginning. It's been a slow process of understanding what we need and what we don't need. So if you overpack on this trip, your next trip, you're going to learn a few things and you're going to pack less, I hope. I do think it's a bit of a learning curve. I look back at our last trip to Oaxaca five years ago and I have a picture of all of us with all of our stuff and it's a little crazy. We've made a lot of progress since then and we also don't have as much gear to bring. Which brings me to the next most commonly asked questions, which is car seats. I think there's not really any way around it. Traveling with car seats is a huge pain, a huge pain. We have almost always traveled with car seats, our own car seats, even if we're renting. And I have no regrets around this. If we're flying to a new destination and we have our own car seats, we're renting a car, I immediately feel more confident that we arrive. We know how to install these car seats. We know that these car seats are in good conditions, etc. Now, one thing I will say, if you're going international, to make sure that you have a locking clip. If you don't know what that is, look that up. 
We did arrive once in Costa Rica and did not have a locking clip and we had to rent a car seat, which was fine, except then we brought our own car seat and then we had to rent a car seat. So we were hauling around way too much stuff. Now, another car seat mistake I made was I brought a car seat on a trip where the only travel we were doing was taking a taxi from the airport to the city. And sure enough, the taxis didn't have seatbelts in the back seat. So I brought this car seat on a six hour flight only to have no way to strap it into the taxi. For us, we felt comfortable taking that small jaunt from the airport to the hotel without the car seat once we figured out we weren't going to be able to buckle it in anyways. And we just went for it. If you're not going to feel comfortable with that, then definitely making plans in advance for some sort of car to transport you that you know absolutely has car seats. All right, pre-pandemic, we traveled with our daughter in walkable cities and would just take the stroller It was wonderful, but now she's six and she's too big for a stroller and not able to walk for hours. Any tips? Yeah, you're probably going to need to change the trip a little bit. Or you're going to deal with a lot of whining. And if you can deal with a lot of whining, then go for it. But I really do feel like everyone in the family should have positive memories of the trip. And if you plan a trip knowing that your child is going to hate walking for long periods of time and you're going to need them to walk for long periods of time, it feels a little bit like a setup that maybe everyone will come out of this trip unhappy and disappointed. So think outside the box. You know, like I talked about in the interview with Don, doing a double-decker bus tour or a duck tour or some other tour that involves transportation. So it's not so much uninterrupted walking and being sure that you're integrating a lot of child-friendly things along the way. Right. Tips for long international travel with toddlers and babies, not just long flights, but waiting in customs lines, etc. I would say don't be afraid to ask for accommodations. I remember our first big flight with a baby. My son, just before his first birthday, we went to Santiago, Chile. And when we landed and we were in customs, there was a sign that said mothers of nursing babies could go to the front of the line. And I was floored. I'm like, what? I have never seen a sign like that anywhere in the U.S. I mean, really, it should have said All families with babies can go to the front of the line, not exclusively mothers with nursing babies. But the idea that they were prioritizing families, families with young children, was so amazing. So after seeing that, I didn't see that sign again for a long time. I did see similar signs in other places, but I've just kind of operated with the mindset that, yeah, it is harder to travel with young kids than it is traveling solo as adults. So if I have young kids that are having a hard time, I do think it's okay to ask for some special conditions. You know, once I landed after a long overnight flight with a kid who had a headache. So I asked if we could go to the front of the line. If you have a kid that is melting down and struggling in the customs line, flag down an agent. Ask if they could make an exception for you to move to the front to make everybody more comfortable. And that theme in general, kind of asking for support, is something I would encourage as much as possible. Because if your kids are struggling and having a hard time waiting in really long lines after a sleepless night, I would say very few adults are going to get upset if you get to cut the line. I would hope at least. All right, dealing with red-eye flights with kids. So we've done a lot of really big, amazing trips. But what hasn't changed is that we do it very frugally. And foolishly, I would probably add. Um, Usually I book flights way in advance and I book the cheapest flights that I can find. And those are usually at terrible hours. And I always regret that when it comes time to get on the plane. This is a lesson I have not learned, right? Like, oh yeah, a 6 a.m. flight. We've got to leave around 3.30 a.m. We got this. Yeah, that's what I say six months before the trip. And the day of the trip, I'm like, oh, that was a really terrible idea. And I think you have to know your family. If you have a kid that is anxious, inflexible, neurodiverse, like Don and I spoke about, and you know that that disruption in sleep is going to have a lasting effect over days and days and days on your kid, then it's probably not a risk worth taking. Now, I've seen my kids do it, and while it's uncomfortable, we always do survive. So while that is getting outside of our comfort zone, it's one way that I'm willing to do that because... I save a lot of money and then I'm able to do other things on the trip that I maybe wouldn't have been able to otherwise. All right. Hey, Danae, what to do when you've had a rough travel experience and your spouse says we're never traveling again? 
had a really bad flight earlier this year and he no longer wants to travel with small children, but I'm not willing to wait years for our next adventure. (laughs) I'd like to say that time heals. Every trip with kids has hard moments and those moments feel stronger and more profound when you're in them or when you're close to them. But more time that passes, you start to remember them less visually. So for that, I would do some brainstorming with your spouse and say, what was it that was hard? What do you think we can do differently? Well, never doing it again is kind of this gut reaction that sometimes comes out of a hard experience. You may be able to do some brainstorming on not avoiding it, but traveling differently, making different choices, making better choices that serve your family. All right, the last question I'm going to take would love some tips about traveling with tweens. My son gets quite overexcited on holidays and struggles with fitting in with the rest of the family. He will sulk or act up when it's time to go somewhere more suited to his younger siblings or when we need him to come home when he's having fun at the beach. I don't want to be arguing with him and I get frustrated that he doesn't get that the rest of the family are on holiday too and we should all be able to enjoy ourselves. I also want him to have a good time and get to do the things he wants to do too. So this kind of falls in the whining category, which we talked about a little bit, where we know that our kids will whine and we know that they're going to be unhappy. And we have to choose ourselves whether or not we're going to let that whining and unhappiness get the best of us. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like much of a choice, but that's some of our work within ourselves. For a kid like this, who probably falls somewhere in this category of anxious and inflexible, Talking with him a lot about taking turns and how he's going to get to do one activity and then his siblings are going to get prioritized to do another activity. And instead of getting frustrated about his inflexibility, giving him an idea of what he can look forward to, things that are still to come that he might enjoy. I think as a parent, we can really try to sit with that unhappiness that our kids express to us, which is so hard to do. As adults, when we experience discomfort and when we feel like complaining, we've often learned to shut that down and to quiet those voices within ourselves. There's been plenty of road trips where I want to say, are we there yet? How much longer? Oh my gosh, is this trip ever going to end? All of those thoughts have gone through my head. But as an adult, I'm able to contain them. And I know that regardless of who's driving, it's going to take a long time to get there. It's not going to be fun, but we're going to get there. Nothing lasts forever, but with kids, it's different. It sounds like a kid this age, especially, hasn't quite developed that ability to hold those complaints and those thoughts within their heads. Even if there's nothing you can do to accommodate them, especially the, are we there yet? This trip is taking forever, that kind of thing. Reminding ourselves as parents that those feelings are normal. We experience those feelings too. We often just don't verbalize them. So giving some validation to it. Yeah, I hear you. It feels like this trip is lasting forever. We've had to stop to go to the bathroom like 15 times. I sure wish we were there too. Hearing them out, acknowledging their feelings. That validation goes a long way. Or you could use one of my favorites when we're stuck in traffic or not getting to our destination as fast as anyone would like. I'll say, oh, are you bored? Hold on. Let me slap my propeller on top of the car and we'll just lift up and helicopter there. And then my kids kind of giggle and they're like, yeah, right. And that prompts me to say, okay, well, do you have any other ideas on how we could speed this up? And they don't because it's not really a process that you can speed up. And that helps to build in this understanding of we're doing the best we can. It's normal not to like this part. There are good things to come. If there was anything we could do to make this easier on all of us, we would. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Don and also my follow-up Q&A section as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you are traveling this summer, enjoy yourself. Remind yourself to have realistic expectations. If you want to get the links to the show notes and the things we talked about today, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 317. And as always, thanks for tuning in.